Welcome. Today we're doing Doctrine and Covenants section 93. This is my Sunday session that deals with the doctrinal and historical context of this section so that it should help you in your study for this week. Of course, also on Wednesday or Thursday evening, we will produce a roundtable discussion called Follow Him. You can see from this slide that section 93 was given in Kirkland the early part of May, 1833. A group of high priests had met to discuss the construction of the building where they would hold the School of the Prophets. A committee of three men, Hiram Smith, Jared Carter, and Reynolds Cahoon, were appointed to raise the needed funds for this construction of a building. So this committee sent a letter to the saints inviting them to contribute money so that they could establish this house and prepare the things necessary so that the elders could gather into a school called the School of the Prophets and receive instructions from the Lord. Two days after, a group of high priests met on May the 6th, 1833, and the prophet received a significant revelation about the nature of God and man and the eternal destiny of his children. While it's not known why the Lord revealed this in section 93, it's interesting to note that just as the saints were preparing to build the temple to worship the Lord and a building in which the school of the prophets could be instructed, the Lord gave a revelation comparing the human body to the tabernacle of God or to the temple and emphasized the need for his children to receive truth and light. At the end of the section, you'll note that there are some specific instructions to Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Frederick G. Williams, who were the first presidency, and also to Bishop Newell K. Whitney, who would be considered then the presiding bishop. As I was researching this, I did note that there was some speculation that perhaps the first presidency and the presiding bishop were not spending enough time with their families, that they were so engrossed in the work of the church that they may have been neglecting their families to a certain extent. In section 93, verse 1, we get what I like to call the 30-second elevator uh, synopsis. For anyone who's a salesman, you'll know that sometimes you have only 30 seconds to present your ideas. Well, this verse 1 is a synopsis, really, of the entire section. So let's read it. Verily, thus saith the Lord. It shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. We have this from Spencer W. Kimball. I have learned that where there is a prayerful heart, a hungering after righteousness, a forsaking of sins, and obedience to the commandments of God, the Lord pours out more and more light until there's finally power to pierce the heavenly veil and to know more than man knows. A person of such righteousness has the priceless promise that one day he shall see the Lord's face and know that he is. I think a pivotal part of this section in the Doctrine and Covenants comes in verses 19 and 20. Let's just take a look at them. I give you unto you these sayings, meaning verses 1 through 18 that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness. For if you keep my commandments, you shall receive of his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father. Therefore, I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. The Lord poses two questions here, how we should worship and what or who we should worship. He spends the first part of this section explaining the second question and the last part of the section explaining the first question. And really, there's a lot of doctrine involved in here. And so I would really counsel you to slowly and carefully go through and when you're reading this and cross-reference into all of the different areas that they give you. We're so blessed today to have the scriptures so well delineated and marked so that we can cross-reference to all different parts in the scriptures. And I really recommend that you do that as you study through section 93. The early part of this section deals with John, and it can be somewhat confusing. So I searched out and I found this in the Institute Manual. The Gospel of John in the New Testament was written by John the Beloved, 
one of the ancient apostles of Jesus Christ. In the first chapter of his writing, the apostle John included a portion of a record written by John the Baptist, as recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 93. The Lord revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith a portion of the writings of John the Baptist and further promised that the fullness of the record of John would someday be revealed. The reference to John that we find in Doctrine and Covenants section 93 speak of John the Baptist. I know on my first reading through, I was confused, and so I just wanted to make that point. Also, from Bruce R. McConkie, we have the following. From what has been revealed of the writings of the Baptist, meaning John the Baptist, and from what John the Apostle has written in the Gospel, it is clear that John the Apostle had before him the writings of John the Baptist when he wrote his Gospel. So John 1, 1 through 38, and John 3, 23 to 36, are quoted or paraphrased from that which was first written by John the Baptist. So if you look at, in the New Testament, the gospel according to St. John, there's a very, very famous scripture, John 1.1, 1, 1, that reads, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, this can be very confusing. So I'm going to try to give you a little background to help you in understanding it. If you look at the original word for the word, which we find in John, in Greek, it was logos, which means a word or a statement or a speech. It can even mean an utterance or a plan. It, it has many different ideas. And this is one of the problems that we have in translation. Anybody who went on a mission to a foreign country, you know, or anyone that knows a foreign language, you understand that it's very difficult sometimes to have direct translations mean exactly the same thing. So let's just take a look at this. I found an interesting article uh, written by Eric D. Huntsman, who talked about logos, which in Greek represents not only the spoken word, but also the ideas behind the words, and hence the meaning by which one person conveys his thoughts to another or puts his ideas into effect. And so he gave us an alternate translation of John 1.1, 1, 1, which we just read. And so his translation would be, in the beginning was the plan, and the plan was with Jehovah, and the plan was Jehovah. So that puts a whole different kind of a meaning to John 1.1. 1, 1. Then if you use the cross-referencing, which we talked about, you get to what we call the Joseph Smith translation, or the inspired version. And this is what Joseph Smith changed that original scripture to read. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. So you can see that sometimes it's difficult to make direct translations and that the more we study and the more we learn, the more we can comprehend the ideas, the concepts that the ancient apostles and prophets were trying to convey to us. And a look at other translations is sometimes very, very helpful. As you go further into this section, which as I indicated previously, is very doctrinally rich, you find such things as the spirit of truth, or the only begotten of the Father, and I thought we would just look at those briefly. The title, The Spirit of Truth, helps us to understand that Jesus Christ does not lie, and that he possesses a fullness of truth. He reveals truth to mankind. The title, The Spirit of Truth, is also used to refer to the Holy Ghost, who testifies of Jesus Christ. The other thing that we will soon come across reading this section is the term, The Only Begotten of the Father. We find that in verse 11. Jesus Christ is the greatest being to be born on the earth. God is the father of the spirits of all mankind, but Jesus Christ is the only person who was born into the world as a literal son of God in the flesh. Because Jesus Christ was born of an immortal father, he had power over death. This power allowed him to accomplish the atonement and resurrection for all mankind. Sometimes I think we have the mistaken impression that Jesus Christ came to this earth with an unfair advantage, that he came 
fully comprehending everything and that he understood everything. But that's not true. As you go through and you read section 93, you understand that he was born almost like a blank slate, like all of us. He didn't, didn't know anything. He was totally dependent on his parents. He had to learn line upon line, precept on precept, just like all of us have to do. He went from grace to grace. Our Savior was a God before he was born into this world, and he brought with him the same status when he came here. He was as much a God when he was born into the world as he was before. But as far as this life is concerned, it appears that he had to start just as all other children do and gain his knowledge line upon line. Without doubt, Christ came into the world subject to the same conditions as was required of each of us. He forgot everything. He had to grow from grace to grace. That from Joseph uh, Fielding Smith. In April 1844, the prophet Joseph Smith taught the following to the saints. Here then is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God. And you've got to learn how to be God's yourself by going from one small degree to another and from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, until you attain the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in the everlasting burnings and to sit in glory as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. The righteous who have died shall rise again to dwell in everlasting burnings in immortal glory, not to sorrow, suffer, or die anymore, but they shall be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What is it? To inherit the same power, the same glory, the same exaltation until you arrive at the station of a God and ascend the throne of eternal power, the same as those who have gone before. I think more than anything else, Doctrine and Covenants section 93 teaches us that Jesus did it, that he came to earth, he was born, just like all of us, and then he showed us how to do it. And he also provided the atonement of Jesus Christ to make it possible for us to follow him. I was listening to a presentation this week, and this man told the story of his very young son who followed him around when he was cutting the grass, and he had a little toy lawnmower. And when he filled it with gas, uh, his son took his sippy cup and he filled, he pretended to fill it with grass. He pretended to start the engine and then he basically followed him around wherever he went. And to me, this was a perfect example of what we would call hero worship. The boy really wanted to just be like his dad. In my research, I found this statement in The Promised Messiah from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. Perfect worship is emulation. We honor those whom we imitate. Basically, we worship the Savior by doing what he did. When we go to our worship meetings, when we go to our sacrament meetings, aren't we doing exactly what the Lord has shown us to do? We prepare and serve the sacrament. We pray. We sing. We teach each other. We have active participation. We help one another. And that's what worship is. It's emulating, it's duplicating, it's following what the Lord has shown us to do. And this section, more than anything else, shows us that we can return to live with our Heavenly Father by simply following the Savior. Now, sometimes we get overwhelmed. We think, how are we going to do that? We're, we're not Jesus. We're not perfect. Okay, that's true. We are not perfect. We're not complete in that sense but he showed us the way. And then there's this counsel from Lorenzo Snow. Do not expect to become perfect at once. If you do, you will be disappointed. Be better today than you were yesterday and be better tomorrow than you are today. The temptations that perhaps partly overcome us today, let them not overcome us so far tomorrow. Thus continue to be a little better day by day and do not let your life wear away without accomplishing good to others, as well as to ourselves. Now, I want to take a little bit of an aside here. Since the 5th century, Christians have imposed an impossible gulf between God and his creations. Christians came to believe that we were created from nothing, that God was not a craftsman who refashioned existing materials, but 
who created something mysterious, something completely different. This Bible parent-child description of God's relationship to us was understood largely as a metaphor instead of as a literal kinship. To suggest otherwise, anciently, was thought to be blasphemous, that it lessened God or it elevated mankind to a lofty level that was unacceptable. This occurred because of an argument, a discussion that turned into an argument, beginning with a man named Arius, who was a, an elder, a presbyter, a priest. And he is credited with starting the doctrine of Arianism, in which he was talking about the nature of the Godhead. And he emphasized that God, the Father, was unique, and that Christ was subordinate or under the Father. But there was a huge pushback from many of the clergy of the day. And this opposition became then the dominant Christian theology of the Trinity. And it was the major topic of the First Council of Nicaea, which was convened by Emperor Constantine in the year 325. Basically, Constantine could see that the Roman Empire was fragmenting. And so he thought that if he could unite the people with religion, so he had them adopt the Christian religion. And then if he could unite the Christian religions, because there had been so many splinters, so many different ideas that had occurred since the time of Christ and the loss of revelation, if he could unite them all in a council, and if they could create a creed, then he would be able to strengthen the empire. And so this great argument occurs, wherein the leaders of the then churches create these creeds. And if you remember, when Joseph Smith had his first vision, the Lord indicated that these creeds were an abomination because they obscured the true nature of God and the true teachings that existed from the time of the apostles. There was even an edict that was given by the emperor against this idea of the true nature or the truer nature of God. And if anybody was found possessing writings, they were killed. They were destroyed. The penalty was death. We have this statement from Joseph Smith. God has created man with a mind capable of instruction and a faculty which may be enlarged in proportion to the heed and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect. The nearer a man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views and the greater his enjoyments till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin. And like the ancients arrives at a point of faith where he is wrapped in the power and the glory of his maker and is caught up to dwell with him. But we consider that this is a station to which no man ever arrived in a moment. In section 93, verse 29, we read, man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither in indeed can be. And from Joseph Fielding Smith, we have the following comment. Some of our writers have in, endeavored to explain what an intelligence is, but to do so is futile, for we have never been given an insight into this matter beyond what the Lord has fragmentarily revealed. We know, however, that there is something called intelligence, which also existed. It is the real part of man, which was not created or made. This intelligence combined with the spirit constitutes a spiritual identity or individual. The spirit of man then is a combination of the intelligence and the spirit, which is an entity begotten of God. There's a common thought today that God's laws are outdated, that we need to change them, that times have changed, therefore the laws of God need to change as well, to be updated. But we have the following from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. So many have erred thinking that freedom included both freedom to obey or not to obey eternal laws, and wrongly, that it included freedom to change those laws. Not so. Ultimately, freedom involves choice between eternal alternatives, but not the altering of the alternatives. We can choose wickedness or happiness, but not wickedness with happiness. We can't change the rules. The rules are eternal. The Lord has set them out. We have the choice to either obey or not to obey, but we don't have the right to
to change the laws and to change the rules. In verses 33 to 35, there's a discussion about eternal elements and the spirits and the, and the tabernacle or the body or the temple. Your body is a temple. We have the following from Elder Bednar. Because the physical body is so central to the Father's plan of happiness and our spiritual development, we should not be surprised that Lucifer seeks to thwart our progression by enticing us to use our bodies improperly. Our physical bodies indeed are temples of God. Consequently, you and I must carefully consider what we take into our temple, what we put on our temple, what we do to our temple, and what we do with our temple. And we can learn a number of important lessons by comparing the church's temples to our physical bodies as temples. In verse 36, there's a very famous scripture that states the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. If you love the truth, if you have received the gospel in your hearts and love it, your intelligence will be added upon. Your understanding of truth will be expanded larger than in any other way. Truth is the thing above all things in the world that makes men free. If you will learn the truth and walk in the light of truth, you shall be made free from the errors of men. You will be above suspicion, above wrongdoing of every description. God will approve of you and bless you. It isn't all that is necessary to learn the truth or to cease to be ignorant. Following that comes the application of the understanding and the knowledge that we gain to those works and things that are needful for our protection and for the protection of our children, our neighbors, our, our homes, our happiness. Search out the truth of the written word. Listen for and receive the truth declared by living prophets and teachers. Enrich your minds with the best of knowledge and facts. Of those who speak in his name, the Lord requires humility, not ignorance. Intelligence is the glory of God, and no man can be saved in ignorance. Another scripture that I'd like to highlight is found in section 93, verse 40. But I have commanded you to bring your children up in light and truth. This is a statement also from Robert D. Hales. Lightness dispels darkness. When light is present, darkness is vanquished and must depart. More importantly, darkness cannot conquer light unless the light is diminished or departs. When the spiritual light of the Holy Ghost is present, the darkness of Satan departs. Beloved young men and young women of the church, we are engaged in a battle between the forces of light and darkness. If it were not for the light of Jesus Christ and his gospel, we would be doomed to the destruction of darkness. But the Savior said, I am come a light into the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In this world, the darkness is never far away. In fact, it is always just around the corner, waiting for an opportunity to come in. If thou doest not well, the Lord said, sin lieth at thy door. It is as predictable as any physical law. If we let the light of the spirit flicker or fade by failing to keep the commandments or by not partaking in the sacrament or praying or studying the scriptures, the darkness of the adversary will surely come in. That wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth through disobedience. It's kind of like being on an escalator that's going down. And if you stop doing the right things, if you stop introducing light into your life, then the darkness slowly begins to encroach. As you get to near the end of this section, particularly in verses 41, 44, 47, and 50, you'll see that the Lord calls out specific individuals. He starts with Frederick G. Williams, Sidney Rigdon, and Joseph Smith, who were then the first presidency. And then he moves on to Newell K. Whitney, who is the presiding bishop of the church. So the leading brethren of the church, he says to them that they need to set their houses in order, that they're standing rebuked before him. So after teaching the true nature of God as our heavenly father and the nature of eternal families and how we can return to live with him by following the savior, he then calls out the, the leading brethren of the church by saying that they're not doing enough to teach their families about truth and light, about the things that they're learning. To conclude today, I'd like to read something that was written by Robert D. Hales. 
the First Presidency issued a call to all parents to devote their best efforts to the teaching and rearing of their children and gospel principles, which will keep them close to the church. The home is the basis of a righteous life, and no other instrumentality can take its place or fulfill its essential functions in carrying forward this God-given responsibility. The First Presidency taught that by teaching and rearing children in gospel principles, parents can protect their families from corrosive elements. They further counseled parents and children to give the highest priority to family prayer, family home evening, gospel study and instruction, and wholesome family activities. However worthy and appropriate other demands or activities may be, they must not be permitted to displace the divinely appointed duties that only parents and families can adequately perform. With the help of the Lord and, and his doctrine, all the hurtful effects from, from challenges a family may meet can be considered and overcome. Whatever the needs of a family member may be, we can strengthen our families as we follow the counsel given by the prophets. The key to strengthening our families is having the spirit of the Lord come into our homes. The goal of our families is to be on the straight and narrow path. Now, this was given back in 1999, but you can see that now with the, with the recent changes to a home-centered gospel instruction that we have through the Come Follow Me program, the one in which you're participating right now, that the Lord has really raised the bar, has told us that this scaffolding of the church that exists is there only to support us, that we need to take the, the lead, we meaning parents, in teaching our children, our grandchildren, even our great-grandchildren, and helping them understand how it is that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can return to live with our heavenly family, that God has provided a plan. And section 93 really demonstrates how if we follow the Savior, if we do what he's asked us to do, if we follow the brethren, the leaders of the church that will be able to return to live with our heavenly father as families. And of this I testify in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.